I'd like to welcome you all to this Mass. Special welcome to all those following us online as we approach Christmas. We've been preparing ourselves until now the fourth week of Advent. And we shall begin as one family in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. As we await the King coming to us at Christmas, we want to remember that we are sinners before the Lord and ask for healing. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Almighty God have mercy on us all. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, creator and redeemer of human nature, who willed that your word should take flesh in an ever virgin womb, look with favor on our prayers. That your only begotten Son, having taken himself our humanity, may be pleased to grant us a share in his divinity who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The first reading reading from the second book of Samuel. When King David dwelt in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies round about, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom? I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of the Lord. The responsorial psalm, and the response is... I will sing forever of your mercies, O Lord. I will sing forever of your mercies, O Lord. I will sing forever of your mercies, O Lord. Through all ages my mouth will proclaim your fidelity. I have declared your mercy is established forever. Your fidelity stands firm as the heavens. Response. I will sing forever of your mercies, O Lord. With my chosen one, I have made a covenant. I have sworn to David, my servant. 
I will establish your descendants forever and set up your throne through all the ages. Response. I will sing forever of your mercies, O Lord. He will call out to me, You are my Father, my rock, the rock of my salvation. I will keep my faithful love for him always. With him my covenant shall last. Response, I will sing forever of your mercies, O Lord. The second reading, a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brethren, to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, amen. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Listen now to a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph and of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and, in, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from him. The Gospel of the Lord. Today in the Gospel we have that powerful story of the angel Gabriel coming to Mary with the greatest news in the history of humans, in the history of humanity. The angel comes to a teenager in Nazareth, a poor teenager in Nazareth, and brings the good news from God himself. 
I'm not quite, quite sure how Mary reacted. We don't have the details of his body language. But I can imagine how, what a moment it was for her to suddenly have the angel being sent by God to talk to her in the first place. In that story, there's one thing that is clear. God takes the initiative. God takes the initiative. It says, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. God is taking the initiative. It's not us humans. We like to take initiatives about everything around us. And in most cases, we like to take initiatives, and when we think we need God, then we invite God into our lives. We like to take initiatives and then later on invite God in our lives. Here, it's clear that God takes the initiative. If we go back to the story of creation, again, God is taking the initiative. Even after Adam was, was created and was all alone, again, God took the initiative to create Eve. God is always taking the initiative. And today, he has taken the initiative again to come and save his people. And Father General, Father Former General, was very clear to us, talking about humility. And he said to us, we Jesuits have to be humble when we go to a new place to start any ministry, when we go to what we Jesuit call the frontiers. He said, our assumption is that when you go to a new place, we bring God there. He said, that's not true. We find God there already. We need to be humble to understand that we find him there already. We don't go with God to a new place. Even when we go to the remotest place where there are you know, old tribes to start a mission, to start a church, we should not assume that we arrive with God there to these people. We must understand that God has already taken the initiative and he is there, and he is there. And we also see that in this story, God chooses the weakest approach, so to speak. He chooses a poor teenager, Mary, in a poor village in Nazareth to execute this grand plan for humanity. That's his approach. He chooses a poor teenager in this, in this grand plan for salvation. And I ask myself, couldn't he find a better plan? Wasn't there going to be a better plan, surely? It's hard for us adults to trust teenagers with anything. It's hard. But look at what God is doing here. He's trusting a teenager for this grand plan. It's hard. I saw it when my, my niece um, and my nephew took their licenses. You know, it was hard for my brother to let go his, the keys to his car, just to send them to the shops. No, they will bash it. We, we have this whole fear with teenagers and not trusting. It's very interesting that God, the whole of God, trusts a teenager. The whole of God decides to trust a teenager. And when I was reflecting on this reading today, I said to myself, it's actually funny that most of the young people, especially teenagers, ignore Mary. They just basically ignore her. They're not connected. But this is the great story of a teenager who is trusted by God. And I think Mary should be that person who is inspiring to the younger people who is inspiring to the teenagers because of this particular story that God is trusting a teenager. If there was a movie or a novel, we could have an amazing, an amazing, an amazing story of the adventures of Mary. The adventures of Mary. A teenager who was trusted by God. A teenager who had to carry the Son of God. A teenager who grew up, bore a son, a teenager who had to watch her son being crucified. This is a great story of a teenager in the history of humanity. Usually we like to be inspired by uh, young people who make it uh, big in life. Uh, I've heard stories of, of youngsters who have reached 25 years of age and they are already CEOs of huge companies and we're amazed with that. We're amazed with that. And if you look at musicians as well, any teenager who makes it big on the world charts in music, they make the headlines. Teenager has done it in the top 10, or top five, or top three. In football, it's the same. Any teenager who plays for his national team at 18, 
or 16. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And yet, come to think of it, all that is nothing if you look at Mary. All that is nothing if you look, if you look at Mary. A poor teenager accepts to play the, big, the biggest role in the salvation plan for humanity. Wow. Wow. Forget about all those CEOs at 20 or 25. Forget about all these teenagers like Rooney playing for the national team and, and Manchester United while still a teenager. Forget about all that. Forget about all that. Justin Bieber. Forget, forget about all those, all those people. Just think of men accepting this big responsibility to take part in this grand plan of God to save humanity. And so why are young people not connected or inspired by Mary? I was asking myself, why do they just ignore her? Why do they just ignore her? She's right there. I wonder with the teenagers in here making, having any connections with Mary when they look at her. She's just there boring. She's just there boring, isn't it? But why? I, I was saying to myself, I think it's because of what we adults have done with her. We've made Mary belong to adults. We've made Mary belong to adults. Especially the title, which is appropriate, which is proper. The title, the mother of God. The moment you say the mother of God, we've taken away from teenagers. The moment you say the mother of God, we've taken her away from teenagers. But this story here, she's not a mother here. She's just a simple teenager. Right here. She's not yet a mother. She's a simple teenager accepting this big responsibility. And we've gone ahead even the way we preach, even priests. We exclude teenagers in the way we portray Mary. She's that holy person that you can't even imitate because she's just beyond us. There's nothing can learn from her because she's beyond us. And when we emphasize the fact that she was born without sin, we think, oh my God, nobody can do that. Nobody can even be inspired by her because, well, she's just beyond us. She's not beyond us. She's not beyond us. He, this is the story of a teenager accepting to do God's will within a little world and saying the big yes to this big plan. So what can we learn from this teenager Mary? She believes. She believes she's not cynical. Even when she asks that question, how is this going to happen? She's not being cynical. She just wants to know a little bit of how it's going to happen, how this is going to happen. She believes. She believes. She needs a certain level of understanding of what is going on. But at the same time, if you look at her, she resists the temptation of what to do everything. How will it all work? What will happen to me? And all these things. She resists that temptation. She simply asks a simple question, and the answer says, yeah, the Holy Spirit will, will, Spirit will overshadow you. And for her, that's enough. For us, the temptation is to question everything. Everything. How will this work? And how will this happen? And I don't know. You know, what will I, will I be safe? And all these things. We like to question things. But she questions with a lot of belief in her. She simply wants to know a little bit so that she's comfortable. She doesn't want to know everything. It's interesting that how we human being, beings question everything about God. When these things like this, then God does not exist. When it's like this, where is God? Oh my God, life is like this, where is God? And all. We like to question everything about God. And yet we don't question the basic things that human beings create. When you go into a car or when you go into a bus or a plane, we always believe it's going to work. When I'm traveling to the UK, I believe that I'll be at the airport in that aircraft. I don't even question the, the, the pilot whether the engine is okay. Is it okay? You know, is the fuel good there? You know, before I board them, I just board with faith. I just hope we're going to take off and go and land. But when it comes to God, we question a lot of things. We question so much. Why is this happening to me in my life? I'm praying good. I'm not, I'm not praying good enough. Why, where is God in all this? People are suffering. Where is God? We question so many things. Here's Mary. Simple question, and she has basic information about what God is doing with her, and that's enough. She's not questioning everything about how it's all going to work out. She trusts. The other thing we can learn from her, she trusts. She trusts that all will be well. She does not ask the angel Gabriel for reassurances. At that point, she knows that she's in a very complicated social situation. Where she, if she's found pregnant, it's a big issue for the whole family. But she doesn't ask for reassurances. She doesn't say, no, 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 Gabriel. I think you have to say this to Joseph yourself. 
this is too much for me, or let's call the parents. Please bring everybody together so that we're all on the same page. This is going to be tricky for me. She trusts. She says it's going to be fine. She trusts. If it was some of us who would have said, no, 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 this is a bit too much. Can we call Joseph, put Joseph there? My parents, the parents say now, Gabriel, please tell them so that I'm clear here. It's going to be very complicated. Very simple, she trusts. She trusts that all will be well. She knows the social complication that comes with being found pregnant without a, a man. She, she knows that, but she trusts. She also knows how to handle change. This is a big change for her. She had her own dreams to be married by Joseph. She had her own dreams, you know, and suddenly God just comes in and everything changes. She's not upset. She knows how to handle that, that, that change from what she desired herself personally and from what God wants of her. And this is where a lot of us don't know how to manage the change. And that's why we, we can't bow to the will of God because the change is too much. Sometimes we feel like doing that, doing something for God, but then our instinct, because of our personal interests, we say, I can't do that. Because the change is too much. We don't know how to handle that change. We don't know how to handle that change. This teenager knows how to handle change. This is a big change for her. It's huge. Her whole life has just changed by that visit by the, the angel Gabriel. But she's there, very calm, very level-headed. And another thing that we can learn from this teenager is that she is brave. Oh my God, she is brave. She is brave. She accepts this big responsibility. She accepts this big responsibility. After just one question, she just asked one question that was answered, and she says, in that case, yes, I accept. We do a lot of interviews here at the school, and usually, when we zero down to our candidate, we usually offer them a contract, and usually they take the contract away at home to look at it, to look at the contract first before they say yes. Some people spend two days before they get back to us. They have to really understand how to work, you know, how much money they're getting, and you know, all these terms and conditions. If they have some queries, the phone and say, what does it say here, you know, 4.4.2, 4 you know, and all these things. They have all the time to, to think about it. She doesn't, she's brave, she doesn't. she doesn't. She doesn't check the contract thoroughly to want to understand every detail. She knows it's God and therefore she trusts. She's brave. She accepts. She says, I'll do this. She's told you're going to be the mother of God, the mother of his son. And she says, I'll do this. That's a teenager. She's just 15, by the way, that time. At 15 years, she says, I'll do this. I'll be, I'll be, the, I'll be the mother of the son of God. I can do this. This is very brave. And a lot of us lack that brevity, that bravery. We lack that bravery in many situations where we're offered an opportunity by God to take part in that plan that is, 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 is heaven for us and for people around us. And, and we find it hard to accept. We're not brave enough to say, I can do this. How many opportunities have come our way and we've said no because we're not brave enough to, to take up those opportunities. It could be a project, it could be an idea, it could be something offering you to do something. But because we're not brave, we've let God down. Here's a teenager. Here's a teenager who's so brave and says, I can do this. I can be the mother, of, be the, mother of, of, of the son of God. Yes, I can. I can do this. She is so brave. And today I want us to look in our lives and I want us to pray for all the teenagers around us. I want to pray for these teenagers that we've not trusted. We've not given them a chance. And I want us to pray again for teenagers to, to look at Mary and be inspired by her. And saying that, as a teenager, I have so much to contribute to the world. In most cases, we've given this impression to the young people that they can only contribute to the world when they grow up. For now, be, be busy with school. You're not contributing anything. Just go to school, pass. Your time will come to contribute to the world. No. God is saying, where you are as a teenager, now you can begin to contribute to the world. Don't wait to be an adult. So today we pray in thanksgiving for all the teenagers in our lives, for all those teenagers that we, we, we have not let us down, that we have trusted, but for all the teenagers who are afraid also to be trusted and who are afraid to trust them. 
we also pray, like I said, that Mary becomes a symbol of the teenager that is powerful, that is brave, who trusts, who believes, that is, who is well, who is level-headed, a teenager that we can look up to and say, yes, we can be like Mary. Let us now stand and profess our own faith. I believe Dear God, our Father, today we bring into your hands all the young people, especially the teenagers. We pray for all those young people who have been denied the chance to contribute to the world, to contribute to your, to, to, to your plan, either through lack of jobs or through lack of education. Lord, open up spaces and opportunities for these young people so that they may be part of your grand plan in people's lives. Lord, hear us. Remember all the young people also are suffering at this time with anxiety, frustration. Console them, Lord, and give them hope. Lord, hear us. We pray for the little ones who have no access to education, access to, to medication. We pray that, Lord, you can heal them and look after them. Lord, hear us. In the depth of our hearts, you may bring your own prayers to the Lord. And dear God, our Father, these are the prayers we bring to you and many other prayers deep down our hearts, prayers that you know already. We still ask you to grant them through Christ our Lord. This bread we offer, fruit of the earth, work of our hands, it will become the bread of life.
Let us now pray, my sisters and brothers, that this our sacrifice here may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Sanctify these gifts of your church, O oh Lord, and, and grant that through these venerable mysteries we may be nourished with the bread of heaven through Christ our Lord. The Lord with, be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just. Our duty in salvation, always and ever to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he assumed at his first coming the lowliness of human flesh and so fulfilled the design you formed long ago and opened for us the way to eternal salvation that when he comes again in glory and majesty and all it is at last made manifest, we who watch for that day may inherit the great promise in which now we dare to hope. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts of the powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of, the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Holy. Indeed, holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness, make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the Jew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us now proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have your us worthy to be here in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church, spread throughout the world, and bring it to the fullness of charity together with Francis our Pope, Robert our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all those who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all. We pray that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the Blessed Apostles, and with all the saints who please you through all the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, O glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. We shall understand and pray in the words our Savior taught us. As we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our day. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant us peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress. 
as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and righteously grant a peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God. You take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God. You take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God. You take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And happy are we who are called to his banquet. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say your word, and my soul shall be filled. In the body and blood of Christ, we must be everlasting life. Soul of my Savior, sanctify my breast, body of Christ, be thou my saving guest. Blood of my Savior, bade me in thy tide, wash me Be oh blessed Jesus, hear and answer me. Deep in thy wounds, Lord, hide and shelter me. So shall I never.
Let us pray. Nourished by these divine gifts, Almighty God, we ask you to grant our desire that aflame with your spirit we may shine like bright torches before Christ when he comes, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your May Almighty God bless us all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Mass is ended. Let us go and love and serve the Lord. I wish you all a pleasant day.